Hi, this is Coach MJ on another episode of the Real Mission I'm Possible show. Today, we have a 23-year veteran. His name is Colonel Oakland McCulloch. Oakland has asked me to call him Oak, so we will be doing that during the episode with the occasional Colonel for reverence of his rank. He is now retired, though. He's going to tell us a little bit about what he's been up to. But as a speaker and as an author on leadership, we've invited him on today so that we can have a little ping pong back and forth about what makes good leadership, what makes bad leadership, what's the difference between being a boss and being a leader, and how you should be mentoring others if you really are the leader's leader. So first of all, this is a big welcome to Mr. Oakland. Come on on. Thanks, sir. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on your show, MJ. Yes, sir. We're really delighted. Uh, we had a little pre-show uh, conversation. I got to know you a little bit about where you were moving around, and I want to get right into it. Uh, did leadership uh, training come to you from the United States Army, or did you bring some skills into your rank? Yeah, well, I, you know, because I always get asked, are, are leaders made or are they born? And I think it's a combination. And and I, when I say that, I think if you don't believe me, go out on any soccer field where there's fifth and sixth graders playing soccer and there's a leader on that team he may not be called the coach or, or the leader but there's people those little kids are following that other kid so there is some leadership that i think is inherent in some people now you can develop it and you can certainly take somebody who has very little and develop it into the leadership i was lucky i was i was always the leader of my you know the captain and leader of my sports teams i played baseball basketball football growing up and then uh i was student government pr president and all that kind of stuff so i had some leadership some leadership stuff that i brought to the table when i went into the army but uh certainly the army helped develop me not just my through my training but i can tell you right now some of the best leaders i've ever worked with were people who i was in charge of and some of them were better leaders than i was probably and when you say that, let's drill into that. What made them or what made them special for you to be able to turn around and say that about them? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll use an example. My first platoon sergeant, I was a brand new lieutenant. I was a platoon leader and I I took over the platoon while they were out. I came in and and uh, and while they were out on a practicing for a dismounted live fire range uh, exercise. I came in and I came at lunch and they had already gone through most of the training that morning. And the platoon sergeant grabbed me, pulled his arm around me, said, come on over here, sir. Let's go have an MRE uh, lunch and let's talk a little bit. And he was we were talking and he said, look, you're the you're the boss. You're the leader. We'll do anything that you want to do in any way you want to do it. He said, and I was 24 years old, brand new lieutenant. And he said, but I've been in the Army for 23 years. He'd been in the army almost as long as I'd been alive. <laughs> he said, we will do things exactly the way you want to do it. He said, but if you're going to mess up, I'm going to tell you. If you still want to do it that way, we'll do it that way. You're in charge. He said, but it's my job to make sure that I, I help train you and make you the leader you're supposed to be. And he did. Sergeant First Class Pinson, never forgetting, six foot six, 250 pounds, big old Mississippi boy. Uh, and he took care of me and, and taught me that the most important thing, two most important things as a young leader is, number one, listen to the people who have some experience because they they have just as much experience, probably more in most cases than you do. And if you only use your experience, then you're cheating yourself as a leader. And the second thing he made sure I understood was to take care of the people that you lead. Uh, if you take care of the people that you lead, they'll do anything you want for them. Yeah, and that that comes down to empathy and having empathy for people in general and then carry showing people that you care about them. And um, you can't fake it because they, yeah. they'll figure that out. You know, and, and the, I, I always tell people, look, leadership is leadership. Doesn't matter where you learn it, doesn't matter where you practiced it. And leadership is about people. And if you don't understand that, you're never going to be a good leader. No, I totally agree. I, in fact, I've paraphrased it. I've, I've basically said that uh, leadership requires respect, but respect is like an ATM card, debit card. If you don't have any respect in the bank first, uh, you don't expect to withdraw any out. So absolutely, by showing others that you respect them first, that's the first way for you to pull water out of that well. Yep, I agree, NJ. Absolutely. 
Yes, sir. Tell me, uh, out of the leaders that you've met outside the the U.S. Army or the military in general, um, who are people that you you admire as exemplary leaders? We can talk about people who past or present, but uh, let's give you a chance to think about this. I know it's a pop quiz. But try to oh, give us three, right. three people that you say, gosh, you know, that's a really great leader, and here's why. Yeah, so I will tell you the three people who had the most influence on me growing up, and I'll use that as an example. N- number one was my father, obviously, um, and uh, and and he he had a huge impact on. I am who I am today because of him. There's no doubt about that, good and bad. Because <laughs> there were certain some good, there were some leadership lessons I learned not to do based on him as well. Um, but certainly him. And then I always tell people. Uh, my basketball coach in high school, Coach Nidzwicki, uh, Terry Nidzwicki, who I still stay in touch with, um, was a huge, had a huge impact on me. And again, a servant leader. He believed, and you could tell he believed, and I, and there's no doubt about it, that he wasn't there just to develop a, a good basketball team. He was there to develop young men and women who were going to be productive members of society. And he did that. And I give him a lot of credit for who I am today. A, a lot of the lessons I learned that I use today were things that he taught me. And then uh, the third one was my high school history instructor, teacher, um, Charles, Mr. Charles Schindler, who I still stay in touch with as well, Vietnam veteran. Um, and he, uh, he he had a huge info. And that, that's why I, I majored in history in college and was because of him. He, he he instilled that love of history in me. And and again, understood that part of his job as a teacher wasn't just to teach me teach us history, but was to teach us how to be productive young men and women in society. And uh and I, I took a lot out of those two people as well. Lucky you. That sounds like you had some great role models. I did. And and not throughout my life I've I've been lucky to have some great role models and some great mentors. Well, they say the student finds his teacher, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so in in today's world, you're now a civilian. Um, how's the transition been? Yeah, it, I mean, it, I, it, I miss the, the military. I miss the structure. I miss that. Although some of what I do now, I'm, I'm a department of the Army civilian now. So I work with Army ROTC here at Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University. That's my day job. And I recruit the future leaders of the army. That's what I do. But you know, when I retired in 2009, I, you know, I was a combat arms officer, infantry armor officer, and then I switched over and uh, retired. And I ran the day-to-day operations of a food bank for about two years. You don't get any different than that. That's 180 degrees difference. That was a struggle. That really was uh, just just to figure out the civilian piece of leadership. Again, leadership is leadership. You got to tweak things a little bit, how you say things, how you do things. But the principles are the same as far as I'm concerned. If a good leader is a good leader. Um, but it was it was a little more difficult. And I'll give you an example, you know, motivating people. And that's a huge job of a leader is to motivate their people. And in the Army, it was always easy. We support and defend the Constitution of the United States. We defend the American way of life. No problems def- uh, getting my soldiers motivated. You know what? That didn't work at the food bank. So, so yeah, I took it took me a little while to figure out what it was that really motivated them. And he, here's how it happened: we were doing a planning meeting. It was all I had all of my subordinate leaders in there, and and we're doing this meeting trying to figure out how we were going to do a food handout in about three weeks. And it was the largest food out, handout we do we did while I was there. Um, and about four o'clock, I see people looking at their watch and putting stuff away. And I'm like, what are you doing? And they said, well, it's time to go home. It's four o'clock. And I said, but we're not done. And they said, but it's four o'clock. And I said, okay, go ahead and leave. Anybody wants to leave can leave. I said, but before you leave, let's make one thing clear. Three weeks from now, when we are at this food handout and some 19 year old young lady goes home and can't feed her two year old daughter because we didn't get this right. It's your fault. How many people you think left? Zero. Figured it out. They really were there to help people in the community. 
Now that sounds obvious, but it didn't wasn't obvious to me when I first got there. But then it became very obvious. That's why they were there. Not only the people who work there, but the people who volunteer there. And so it got a lot easier for me to motivate them um, throughout the, the rest of my tenure there as the associate director. And I guess that it must be difficult for not just for yourself, but for anyone else in a leadership position in the civilian world where their one of their tasks is to is to lead younger people who might not have the value set or the historical software um, to appreciate some of the values that you might think are their hot buttons uh, right. because they they have a totally different value system. Yeah, but I think that's part of, and I talk about this during my presentations, and I talked a little bit about it in my book, is part of the other part of the job that I, I always, the three most important things that a leader does besides taking care of their people, the three most important things that, that a leader does is one, you got to have a vision and a plan of where you want that organization to go. And you have to develop the culture. If you think the culture of your organization is just going to develop by itself because you're whatever, it, you're, you're sadly mistaken. I had a conversation with a young man. I say a young man, he was about 35 years old. <laughs> so I had a conversation with him about, I don't know, about three, four months ago. And we and he just started a business and he's hiring people. And I said, and I was talking to him about the importance of building this culture of his organization. And he said, you're, and I said, it takes training and time and effort. And, and, he, and he said, you're wrong. And I said, what? He said, you're wrong. I said, then how am I wrong? He said, I just got to hire the right people. I said, good luck with that young man. Tell me how that works out for you. Yeah. So there are lessons to be learned on all dimensions of this spectrum of leadership. Um, I had several organizations I had in the in the private life as an entrepreneur and had different uh, positions, managers, directors, et cetera. One of the offices that I had gone to just to have a little quick tour and see how everybody was going, uh, oh, I walked in and I said, by the way, where is this? Oh, well, um that uh that girl would know um, where that is who's that girl oh she's new but she knows where everything is and she she knows what everybody's doing and I said, well, let's come and meet this this person so she was their leader yeah didn't have a didn't have a business card didn't have a title didn't have a position didn't have anything but what she did have was a keen interest in seeing that everybody was happy how about yeah. that and 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 be and being successful, you know, in the real world, results matter. In, in fantasy land, you know, where everybody's a winner and everybody gets a trophy. Okay, I guess results don't matter. But in the real world, results matter. And it, those are the people who rise to the top. Those are the people who, whether they have a title or not, because you don't have to have a title to be a leader. Obviously, that young lady didn't. You, people follow you if you are motivated, if you take care of people, if you are interested in getting results, then people will follow you. Yeah. And of course, today, uh, more and more people are talking about leadership than ever before. It used to be a topic where, you know, either if you're a leader, OK, we'll talk about leadership. But for the other people underneath the mushroom cone, uh, no. And today now it's being taught in universities, being taught in schools. There are leadership programs probably that you're involved in, as well as, I mean, things things like the Eagle Scouts and all kinds of other programs for youth around the country, right. uh, around the world. I was involved in startup camps for on young entrepreneurs. I'm a young 14 to 21 yeah. uh, in the Middle East, and it was incredible um, the amount of ideas and, and ambition they had at that young age. Um, and developing something called self-leadership. Yeah. Well, you know, at w one of the things I'm a huge believer in is that it's our responsibility as the leaders of today to develop the next generation of leaders. If we don't, if we don't do that, then, then we get what we sowed. I mean, it, and we can't complain because it, it's our responsibility. And if we don't do a good job of it, then we're going get, to get what we deserve. Yes, and if I look back on the leadership workshops, I've had the privilege and honor to conduct in different parts of the world. And I always asked 
who were the top three leaders that you really admire? And then who were the top three leaders that you think were just horrible and horrific? And then we take those characteristics apart and take their DNA apart. And sometimes we find that some of the most horrible leaders in the world did have some very valuable qualities, even though they may have misused them, even though they may have led to horrible or horrific results. But characteristics within people do make them stand out. And yeah. what my my best uh, leadership mentor was my mother. She was the I'm the eldest of eight boys. Imagine the first thing I learned was delegation. That's right. right. You know, there's a list of chores you got to do there, boy. And so, you know, I'd get to the next brother, the next brother, the next brother. So it wasn't just hand me down clothes. It was hand me down chores. Uh, but she was a great master of, you know, making you feel like now, listen, you got to set the example, you know, and she That's was right. appealing to my higher self at the age of six. Well, I was looking for a day off, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know my, my dad put it, put it really well. Um, with, with along with that concept, he, he said, he always used to say, if your actions and your words say something different, then your word, your actions are what's going to be believed. And, you know, your mother obviously instilled that in you and my father instilled it in me, you know, that you set the example, even at a young age, you got to you got to do the right things because it's the right thing to do, not because somebody's watching or or somebody's going to going to find out you do it because it's the right thing. And and I think we have gotten away from teaching that to the youth of today. They don't understand that it isn't about them because it isn't. They may think it is, but it's not. And I blame these things right here for a lot of that. Uh, you know, it's called iPhone and iPad. And it's not about you. It's about your legacy of what you're going to leave behind. And that's not always what you did. It's who you created that's going to step up to do the next generation. And they're going to teach the next generation. When I was working, when I had my last duty assignment on active duty, I ran an Army ROTC program. So I was producing second lieutenants for the United States Army and for the nation. And I had somebody who worked for me. And I say, again, I say he worked for me, Master Sergeant David Powell, who is probably a, a much better leader than I was. And I still stay in touch with him. Um, and he, we were talking one day about the importance of what we were doing. And he said to me, he said, you know, boss, great leadership handed down from generation to generation is what develops great nations. And I thought, wow, what a powerful quote. I wish I could take credit for that quote, but I can't. It's his. And But the most, most powerful thing about that quote is that you can take that word nations and you can substitute anything you want for it company, organization, sports teams, university, hospital, doesn't matter. Families. And it, absolutely. And it do, and it still has the same power no matter what. I mean, because it doesn't change the power of that statement. Because it is all about handing down the next generation, your leadership abilities, the culture, habits, all those kinds of things that make make this country, our families, our organizations great. Thank you for saying that. I really do appreciate what you said there. Tell me this. Three superpowers a leader should be armed with. Three superpowers. Is listening one of them? What's that? Is listening one of them? Absolutely. Communication. And when I talk about communication, I talk about all forms of communication. Verbal, nonverbal communication, written communication, and that includes memos, letters, texts, emails. I hate text messages, but... Um, but uh, all of those and then listening and listening is probably the one that we as not only a society here in America, but in the world, we do very poorly. Most people listen just enough to figure out what they want to say in return. They don't really listen to find out what that person is talking about. So listening is absolutely the the number or communication is absolutely the number one thing. I, I tell people the number two thing is servant leadership. Understand that it's not about you. It's about the people and the organization that you have a privilege to lead. And if you, those are the people who are the best leaders, in my opinion, the servant leaders who understand that, that it's not about them. And then I always tell people the third thing that is most important, the superpower you got to have is to build your team. Um, and if you're lucky enough that you get to build your team in the army, 
lots of times you don't get that opportunity. You inherit and the army decides who's going to be on your team. In that case, if that's your case, then instead of building your team, train your team. Because whoever you got, you got to train them, whether whether you picked them or not. Because if you don't train them, I, this is this is something that just drives me nuts. Somebody will tell me, well, that person isn't isn't meeting the standard. I said, did you train him to the standard? How can you expect somebody to meet a standard that you didn't train them to? I, I mean, that all goes to team building and, and getting getting people to understand what what it is that you're expecting of them. So I think that's that's a huge. Those are the three huge things that I always tell leaders: you got to get right. Yeah, I I agree with that. I also go into I drill into that you have to create a leadership model for them to anybody can follow a model. Yeah, but that's setting the example. That, that if I that ask is people part. to dance, I mean, come on, they yeah. can come up with all kinds of different variations of a dance, even moonwalk. Yeah. We're not going to do that virtually, but when it comes to you know, leadership, then there has to be some standards, some some congruency, the integrity, all of the all yeah. of the um, characteristics that you want to see in that leader. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's to me, that goes along with self, uh, a selfless service person. You know, you're setting the example that you want other people to be in your organization and outside your organization, because people are watching outside your organization as well. But if you don't set the example, then then uh, then you're going to get what you get. I mean, I always tell people here is a perfect example. It's very simple. If I'm walking down the hall and I'm the I'm the leader and I'm walking down the hall and there's a piece of trash on the floor and I don't bend down to pick it up. How can I expect somebody else to do that when they walk by? It, it's all about setting setting the example. And you're and you are the leader 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. you got to set the example all the time. When you get out of your car as a civilian. You go into a grocery store, somebody is discourteous, they bump into you or they take a cart before you, they just don't show you any respect or politeness. Do you ever have one of those moments? Do you know who I am? Do you have or does that ever go into your head? Have you no, ever- it really it really doesn't go into my head. But but I do I do say if somebody does something, I will mention something. I'll either say have good day or something just to get because that's what another thing that drives me nuts is when people walk by you and, and they don't just ignore you you know uh, again we're all all part of a human race here let's put the, put our phones down and let's actually talk to each other and uh treat each other with the respect that that people deserve yeah but of course you know in the military they see you walking with your insignia and you're obviously going to get that instant respect and that instant salute in civilian life, um, I guess I'm not really asking about what was it like to transition into that. You know, I was it was like that yesterday. Today, co- t- completely different. It had to have some, yeah. some feathers ruffled. Come on, it, it did. There were a couple of times when it did absolutely. But but you know, I, I always go back to to the to the quote that Michael Jordan gave. You, you have to earn your respect and leadership every day. So no matter what you did yesterday. And who you were yesterday, today is a different day, and you got to earn it today, just like you did yesterday. And and I do, and I and I say earn because although you know, as a lieutenant colonel, you're right. I'm going to get a salute. People are going to do what I told told them to do because I'm a lieutenant colonel. But I always tell people, I my goal was always to have people want to do the things I asked them to do, not because I was a lieutenant colonel and because I was telling them to do it, but because they wanted to do it. And one of the ways I always tried to do that was every opportunity I had, if I had the time, if we had a a task, a mission, uh, a problem we had to solve, I'd call all my junior leaders in and I'd say, okay, guys, gals, this is what we got to do. Give me some ideas. And so they throw out ideas and some of them were awful. (laughs) Some of them were great. And, you know, the thing that always I always tell young leaders is when you do that, Somebody you think is a superstar in your organization is going to give you a horrible idea, and somebody who's going to give you that you think is your weakest link in your organization is going to give you a great idea. And I had a boss who used to tell me, "Oak, a great idea is a great idea, whether it comes from a private or a general, and a bad idea is a bad idea, whether it comes from a private or a general." But when you do that, when you throw it out there, you're under no obligation to use any of their ideas. But at least you ask, so they at least appreciate that point of it. But what I found out I generally do 
is I'll take a little bit of that person's ideas, a little bit of that person's ideas and throw in some of mine. And that becomes our solution. What you do when you do that is you do two things. Number one, people feel like they're a part of the team, that you're not just the boss, but you include them and they're part of a valued member of the team. And number two, it's no longer Colonel McCullough's idea or solution. It's all of our solution. Now they got skin in the game. Now if they really want to do what it is that we've decided that we're going to do. Now, once that decision's made, now that now we're doing what the decision was made, obviously. But but if you can give people a chance to have some, some input in the decision-making process, when you can, then I think you, you'll find some amazing things will happen. Absolutely. We call that giving them ownership. So when they have Absolutely. ownership, they have buy-in. When they have buy-in, then they're motivated to execute and make it work. And having that team cohesion – uh, that it was a collective uh, mosaic, if you will, of experiences and ideas to make something happen and that their opinion matters. That's powerful magic. It is. Well, and here's the problem. If you don't do that, then you're only using your experience, your knowledge, and your abilities. And there are all kinds of experience and skills and knowledge out there in those other people who are working for you. And if you don't use them, you're cheating yourself and your organization of those that knowledge and that skills and those abilities. Yes. Is, what is the adage? Uh, when you speak, you only repeat something you already know. Yep. Yes, sir. Tell us about your speaking uh, business now. Your COVID has passed. The pandemic is gone, thank, thankfully. And yes. moving on, you're starting to meet some audiences. I saw you got a big event. Coming up in January, I think is in Texas. Is that right? Yeah, I'm going to be in Frisco, Texas, uh, talking to about a thousand first responders, policemen, firemen, EMTs. Um, really looking forward to that. That should be an exciting event. And then uh, in April, I got a speaking engagement in Oregon, where I'm going to speak to all the state fire chiefs in the state of Oregon. Um, and then I got one in San Francisco in June, where I'm going to talk to uh, fiduciary uh, group. And there's, they said there should be about eight to 900 people there as well. Nice. I love big crowds like that. And you can make an impact, of course. It's yeah. kind of like, you know, for a speaker, it's kind of like you have a candle or a torch. You're going to take it into a room and light their candle. So yeah, I, I agree. I, those candelabras of inspiration out into the world. That's wonderful. Yeah, you know, at this point in my life, that really is my passion, just to talk to as many people as I can about about leadership and and try try like I said, you know, try to pass on some of that knowledge that I've had over my last forty years as a leader, and 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 hopefully, and I I always do because I always I, I don't just go and talk my speech and leave. I I like to be in ba breakout sessions. I like to have dinner with the, some of the people, and I like to get their knowledge because again. If you ever think that you can't learn anything else as a leader, go do something else because you're not going to be a good one for very long if that's your attitude. You can learn stuff every day. And I do. And I learn a lot from those conferences uh, talking to all those people. Yeah. And plus, there's all kinds of fast track leadership camps that people can go to. You might be part of something like that. How would how would our guests reach out to you? And can you, first of all, can I just ask you to uh, your your book is called Leadership Legacy. Is that right? Yeah, Your Leadership Legacy, Becoming the Leader You Were Meant to Be. Okay. And if they wanted to reach out to you for a speaking opportunity, where would they go? Yeah, so uh, my website, uh, www.ltcoakmacullough. And it is uh, on there. It has uh, my cell phone number, my email address, and the topics that I talk about. I talk about mainly two topics, leadership and secrets to success. And then, uh, but I also talk about some history. I, I, I am a history major with a ma master's in history. So I talk about some history subjects uh, as well. Um, but yeah, if you want me to come speak at one of your, your events, a, a training event, I was just at a company in Baton Rouge and it was uh, a, a leadership, it was a training uh, event. Um, and so I, I gave my secrets to success on uh, at that uh for that event and uh and it, it wasn't about leadership it was about training and it was about scenario driven uh 
training to see how you would react and those kinds of things. So I, I'm available for any of that. Awesome. Well, it was a wonderful to have you as our guest the first time. I will be asking you to come back when we do our leadership panel later on in the year in 2023. I would love to. Um, you're definitely on the board of leadership here at the Real Mission I Impossible show. It was a great pleasure having you on, and we'll be putting the links for people to get in touch with you, although you did recite it. Uh, and I do appreciate everything. Thank you so much. Uh, Colonel Oakland McCulloch has been with us here today, 20 some odd years of service in the United States Army and beyond. His leadership book is going to be in the links there. Look out for him in stages across America.